Hello, this is The Lid Is On, the UN's flagship news show, which is coming to you from The Gambia. This episode and several more episodes to come, we'll be talking about many aspects of the country, the smallest on the African mainland, and one that's made huge strides over the last <laughs> few years. And who better to start off this series than Nyanya Dawatore, the head of the UN Capital Development Fund in The Gambia. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Kano, for having me today. And thank you for introducing me to Baobab Juice and many other Gambian delights, uh, really delicious food here. Returning migrants in particular, this is something that is, I wouldn't say an issue, but it, it's a new phenomenon, the idea that there's more inward migration than external migration. Why do you think that is? I think there's lack of opportunities. Um, people want to move out of their homes, which is their comfort zones, to look for better opportunities and to take care of themselves and their families. And that's, that's the root cause of whether it is rural or urban or whether it's out of the country elsewhere. But in recent years, people have been coming back. Yes. People have been coming back because they're not welcomed to where they are. Um, they not welcome in the sense they don't feel at home. Their opportunities that they've gone to search are not there. They're not allowed to work. Uh, they're living in worse situations than they were. So they have that sense, strong sense of feeling that we might as well go back to where we're from and see what we can do for ourselves at home. Now for many people in, already in the country, there are limited opportunities. Is there anything that the UN and other organizations can do to actually improve the possibilities for people economically? Yes, and we are doing that. Um, I remember when um, then I was a consultant for United Nations Capital Development Fund and I was part of the team that came to do the scoping mission to design the program and we had met the then ambassador of the European Union and when we asked what kind of program did the EU want and I remember him saying he wants the people that brought about the change, the democratic change, to feel the change. And um, that was integral as part of our programming. Uh, we went rural, uh, we focused on youth, we focused on women. Um, the, the, the majority of that brought, people that brought the change. And uh, we've seen the impact. We've seen the results, obviously, um, governance has improved within the government, but also impact within the communities. And you're just coming from the fields, and we were chatting earlier about Gidon. When I met Gidon two years ago, and he said to me, I never thought I could make it from my own village. Now I don't even think about going to Banju, let alone going to Europe. And uh, this is happening. And it's not only the United Nations Capital Development Fund. You have the International Trade Center, ITC, who we've partnered in our program to support the skills aspect. They're doing a lot as well. They have a program uh, with um, Annabelle and GIZ called Techify. Uh, you can make it in, in your own country. There's IOM with the migration program. You know, you have FAO, WFP, there are a number of agencies. Before 2016, there were seven UN agencies. And after 2016, we have 14 UN agencies. All of us doing our different work within our mandate, but supporting youth, women, and vulnerable communities. Entrepreneurship was one thing that has struck me since being here. The sense that people want to start their own businesses, that they feel that there are more opportunities for now that weren't there under the, under the dictatorship. And this is something that you're trying to support and promote as well. Yes. Um, when we came to Gambia, United Nations Capital Development Fund, because um, my background is economics and finance, so I work a lot on data. Um, and when we did the analysis of the entrepreneur sector, 90% of the MSMEs, that's the micro, small, medium enterprises, where we either at the startup or the survival stage. And you have the 10% that are at the growth stage and the international stage. So we knew there was work needed there, there was support needed there to help uplift some of those businesses that have been there 
that have you know, established, how can we help them get more structured to elevate them to the growth stage. And we've, got, we've done very good um, work with some entrepreneurs. You've met Marua Farms in the field. And uh, he's a Gambian that used to live in the US, came back and um, with his own capital and was finding it difficult. And through the job skills and finance program, we were able to support him move from that survival stage to the growth stage and now he's looking at international stage where he will be able to export his rice. Well let's talk a bit more about what the Capital Development Fund, the UN Capital Development Fund does. Uh, some people might not know that you've been around for several decades but I think for some people who I speak to this idea of the UN being involved in economic development is still controversial. Even cash for work which you're involved in, some people find it hard to wrap their heads around that. But these are ideas that are growing, uh, becoming more more mainstream. Uh, what would you say to people who might find it odd that the UN is giving low interest loans or even grants to businesses? I mean, it's how we look at development. Uh, development has evolved. I think uh, in the early days of the UN, development was focused mainly on humanitarian. Um, um, sort of development. Which is still obviously a big part of what the UN does. Yes, so you know. but development has evolved now to supporting economies, like the challenges that member states are facing. Um, so United Nations Capital Development Fund, for example, our mandate is to provide, to support subnational, you know, so we have the mandate to provide grants to local government, not only central, but local government and the private sector. And what is the advantage of getting involved at that? Some, again, some people might say, this is what the local government should be doing. They should be helping the people. Why is the UN getting involved at this level? We are working with them. We are not doing their work. We're working with the local government. We're working with the private sector, where we would provide these grants that are made, made available to them by um, the donor countries. And we provide the technical assistance to help them in the process. And that's all part of development. Uh, we're dealing with people that are not used to handling their own cash or knowing how to handle their own businesses. So we're trying to address the fundamental challenges that are being an obstacle in development. And our focus for United Nations Capital Development Fund is the least developed countries. Let's turn to climate change, or the climate crisis rather. Now, the Gambia is not really responsible for any of the climate emissions, the carbon emissions that are having such a, a devastating effect around the world, but the country is being affected by this. Your projects are closely linked to sustainability, to a low carbon uh, footprint. When the Gambia is, as I said, a country which really isn't producing many emissions. Why is it important that there's this climate aspect attached to the development programs in the country? I mean, climate is a global concern. It's a global challenge and uh, it's affecting everyone. And I must say Gambia is one of the, if not the only country that has met its nationally determined contribution um, so far. We're leading the way. And um, the challenge right now that's being faced with is the communities that face this disaster, this natural disaster. Uh, how do we support them um, so that they can build resilience to be able to support themselves in the case of natural disaster? And that's the focus of our work um, with the United Nations Capital Development Fund. We have a facility called the Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility, we call it LOCAL, that supports channel climate finance to the local level and it's done in such a way that we have a menu of in investment that addresses different climate areas and gives the communities the freedom to choose um, projects that would address their urgent needs. And we met briefly in Egypt at the UN Climate Change Conference. Yes. And you were talking about locale, yes. the project you just mentioned. One thing I noticed at the UN Climate Change Conference was that there were many uh, African representatives who were arguing that they should be allowed to use their natural resources to develop 
their country to help citizens to have access to electricity and to sell their coal, their gas. Uh, their point being that it is developed countries who were allowed to use their resources and now these countries are the ones telling developing countries that they can't and that they should be compensated in some way. Is this an argument that you heard in Egypt as well? Yes, Conor, I've heard that. I work closely with the least developed um, countries group. Uh, and one, uh, of, one of those countries is the Gambia? Is the Gambia um, on the um, COP, UNFCCC. And um, the sentiment is, same, is the same across. Um, it's a feeling that why do we have to suffer for what we have not created? And I think um, credit has to go to Egypt, that was the host of COP27, to be able to get that loss and damage fund. Um, Which is a big breakthrough, this idea it's a you have a fund to, to compensate yes. African countries, well, countries that are at a lower stage of development yes. for these problems because they are the ones that are suffering even though they didn't cause the problem. Yes, and it's changed the conversation and it's part of that has made to 2023 feel different. Uh, I think when people have been raising their voice and their concerns on a certain matter over a long time and see it actually happen. It makes a big difference. And I think now the goal is how do we get it going? This and is in the this, first step. And in this country, many citizens still don't have access to electricity. And we all know that electricity is really the basis for development. How is the government going to improve access, do you think? And will they be able to do it sustainably and without raising their carbon emissions? I think um, a lot of work has started with the government. At the regional level, you have the OMVG that's trying to support. And what's the OMVG? The, it's a regional um, electricity and water um, program that involves Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, and Guinea-Conakry um, to help sort out the electricity problems in these four countries. At the national level, you have the World Bank um, supporting a lot. Um, with, with energy um, program. So I think also a United Nations Capital Development Fund and the UNDP has a NAMA proje uh, project, which is on um, energy, um, hybrid, solar and, and regular energy. So there's a lot of work being done. I think what's important for the country is to consolidate. Because if you get different help, help coming from different way, and you're not focusing on consolidating, you might not realize your gains too quickly. Um, but there's a lot of work being done and I want to believe and I'm confident that in the next 10, 15 years, um, the electricity problem would, would be solved for the, for the country. We're such a small country with 20, 2 million uh, population. It's not as big as compared to Senegal or our neighboring countries. But, but there is work being done in that area. Well, next few weeks we'll be learning more about how the initiatives you've been involved in have been having an effect when it comes to jobs, skills, training. Um, but the projects are coming to an end as we speak in the next few months. What is next for the UN Capital Development Fund? What is next for you? Well, what's next for us? We're still here. I think what the Job Skills and Finance program has done is enable us to come back to the country because UNCDF was once here in the country um, between, if I get it right, 96 to 2002. And this time around, because of the way we've worked with the government, the way we've designed our programs, for example, the local, which is embedded within the country system, you have that country ownership. And we're going to continue being here. Um, the local is going to be scaled up nationally. Um, the JSF covered four regions and we'll be covering the remaining four regions and 122 districts. So we're here to stay. Uh, we work closely with the government of Gambia um, as the right partner for development and supporting them close the gaps in a different way from the standard way of the UN way of working. Um, we are more outcome focus, which is for the government of the Gambia LDC graduation by 2063. And content driven, how do you get to graduation through the national development plan and country led 
in resource mobilization. I think the main challenge that many UN agencies face right now is core funding. I think donors are no longer interested in funding the operational running of the UN. So that gives us an opportunity, especially with UNCDF that works with the least development countries. They're the only member states that are eligible now for voluntary uh, funding and we've positioned ourselves very well with the government of the Gambia as a development partner um, in the coming uh, Doha program of action, LDC 5 con uh, conference. Uh, we're supporting, working closely with the government of the Gambia through the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Finance to tap into non-traditional donors that would support climate financing, support private sector development that are integral part of the Doha program of action. So uh, we're here to stay for as long as we are being seen as the right partner and useful partner to the country. Well, 2063, uh, hopefully, will still be around to Hopefully, to that's 40 that. years. 40 years. Uh, let's make a date to, to <laughs> meet up back then. But if nothing, we'll be part of the legacy that have initiated this. And I think this is what least development countries need. They need strategic guidance and direction to help them achieve uh, their purpose. But before 2063, uh, as you say, it's 40 years off. In the next 10, 20 years, do you think that if I were to come back, I'd be seeing a very different Gambia from the one I'm seeing now? Yes. In what way? In many ways. I mean, uh, you look at the National Development pa Plan 2017 to 2022. Um, there has been a lot of um, work being done uh, in terms of reforms, in terms of putting policies at the macro level to make the country conducive, uh, infrastructure going on. And this um, National Development Plan would be looking at implementation, implementing those plans from the macro level down to the micro and mesa. So definitely, I would even say 10 years, but if you come here in the next three, five years, there would be changes. Oh, I'll take that as an invitation. Yes. Nyanya, I didn't think I'd meet another West Londoner in the Gambia, but it just shows anything can happen. Thanks very much for giving us an overview, telling us more about yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. It's been nice having you.